And away we go. It's the DFS Other Bird presented by Awesomeo.com, brought to you in part as well by Yahoo DFS. They have a ton of NFL contests coming your way. Also, we'll have more information about Yahoo DFS in a little while. Stay tuned for that. Dan Trevor, Chris Randone with you on this Friday morning. We are sending Dave Lochran off to a wedded bliss this weekend as he and his long-standing love, I guess I can say that he's not here, Justine, are getting married this weekend. Congrats to them. Uh, Chris, how are you doing, sir? Good, man. Uh, congratulations to Lochran. That's pretty awesome. Uh, they, uh, they've been together a long while. They've been living together, I think, like four years. So it's just sort of, he even said, it's a little bit of a formality. I will also say Justine doesn't listen to the podcast, so you can get away with nice. maybe uh, uh, some uh, downplaying of the nuptials. But we wish them well, obviously. Uh, if you ever read the Washington Post story on Lafay, pretty sure he mentioned Justine in there at one point. So if you want to you know, feel connected to them, you can go seek that out uh, out there in the world. But Chris, we have a 15-game slate ahead of us. We have a number of the top pitchers in Major League Baseball on this slate. We have, let's see, seven pitchers on DK above 10,000, and then you throw into the mix the guys like Paddock and Soroka, even Odorizzi, who's had a very solid season until uh, of late, are just below 10K. From an approach standpoint, for you, for a casual player, for MMEing, does that change your even – you know, approach to this kind of just seeing that many pitchers above 10 K and this many high, you know, value pitching names that stand out to you, or is this simply just make sure your projections are right and figure out where you're going? Yeah, I think it's more so the projections and I think you might be a little bit more spread out than normally. Uh, so, I mean, you're not going to have 50, 60% Verlander or 30, 40% Morton. I think you're going to want to kind of have a piece of a lot of these top guys just in case if one of them do go off and you're multi-entering, um, you have that pitcher in that lineup. So I, I think that's probably uh, when it comes to seeing so many top-tier guys, that's kind of the route you want to go. Yeah, and it's a good point about ownership writ large on a slate like this. Uh, you see it in NFL, uh, obviously, where quarterbacks are – it's just spread out. The ownership spread out. And I think you're going to see it on a slate like this where pitching ownership is – subdued or, or uh, restricted in, in a way. And uh, that is an easy plug for the awesome.com ownership projections, which uh, can help you figure out maybe an A or B discussion, two pitchers you have equally projected, similar price points. Where do you go? If you're talking about GPPs, you lean towards the lesser owned pitcher if you think they have the same upside. So uh, of course uh, it will be, Available throughout the day. You can use the promo code EARLYBIRD to get in there uh, if you so choose. With that said, we're going to dive in. We're going to do our best to hit on as many pitchers as possible. There'll be some that get uh, left out of the mix or we simply pass over quickly due to time, not when TBI is here for three hours as we break down 30 pitchers. But uh, I do want to start at the top where we do have Justin Verlander. We've seen what a year he's had, Chris, uh, a 29.1% K-minus walk ratio. Uh, the ERA, XFIP, FIP, all relatively in line. So he's performing uh, how we'd expect him to. He does have a bit of a home run problem this year. Uh, that has been pretty clear, but that's been pretty much negated by the strikeout upside and his ability to limit runs. Though this is an athletics lineup that he's facing that only strikes out 21.3% of the time, good for 20th against right-handers on the year. 12-4 is a pretty hefty price tag. Is Verlander in your plans this early on? For Friday slate? Uh, I mean, obviously, he's the top pitcher on the slate. Um, I think he's more so a cash game play rather than a tournament play. But don't get me wrong. I think uh, if you're multi-entering tournaments and you're able to fit him in somehow, maybe with a, a lower tier pitcher, uh, I, I don't see anything wrong going this route. I know Oakland doesn't strike out as often as maybe some other teams on this slate do. But um, once again, it is Verlander. He does seem to get his strikeouts, and uh, he does also seem to have a heavy pitch count. So you're facing more batters. You're facing more opportunities to get those strikeouts, and uh, it's hard to kind of just not say you want to roster him in this situation. Makes sense to me. As we uh, roll on through, we're going to touch on some strikeout percentage. We're going to talk about uh, you know K-minus walk, home run rates. Verlander uh, gets the, the nod as a hashtag good pitcher <laughs> on a slate where you're going to be spread out. Uh, talent sort of wins out against a lower K percentage for the opposing team. I, I agree with you. I think uh, you find your ways to get to Verlander, but 
it's going to be at either the problem of having an offense that is very low priced or a pitcher that maybe has some definite negative upside or negative downside. I guess that's an oxymoron, isn't it? Definite downside, uh, as it were, uh, in this slate. I will say Charlie Morton does stand out to me, Chris, uh, 11-6 on DraftKings. Uh, he's second on this slate in K-minus walk ratio at 23.4%. He's a 30.5% K rate. Again, ERA, FIP, XFIP, all within line uh, to one another. So performing as he is expected to perform. And he does get a matchup with the Detroit Tigers. Now, the Tigers are a team that strike out the most against right-handed pitchers on the year. 26.8%, WRC plus of 76 a uh, walk rate of just 6.6%, an ISO of 148. Morton's in a pretty damn good spot here as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's really nothing else to say in this situation. Morton, hands down, has the best situation for him on this slate. Uh, save a little bit of money if you pivot down to him from Verlander, and that's obviously a huge upside as well. But um, it's like you said, you're looking at the team that strikes out the most in the majors um, against righties, and – there's not that much power there. So Morton's been good and uh, he's been consistent. There's really a, a time where he has a really bad outing. So this matchup doesn't scare me. He's at home, which favors him. Um, I think all signs point to Morton here and, and wanting to roster him tomorrow. All right. We have a Giolito, Castillo, Corbin, Syndergaard, and Miner are all above 10K as well. Giolito gets the Angels, uh, which is a team that really does not strike out. Uh, against either lefty or righties. Uh, they are, well, I guess actually they've gone down a little bit or up when it comes to K percentage as the year has gone on. They're 21.3%, which is tied with the athletics. So from your point of view, Chris, does Giolito have enough talent to overcome that lower K percentage and better offense for the Angels, or would you stay away from Giolito on this late? I mean, there's no doubt that he has the talent. Um, but I think from a price point stand of view, I just don't think this is the right time to roster him just because I'd rather pay up a little bit more to get that kind of for sure matchup with Morton. Um, or I mean, pivoting down, uh, and saving a bit of money, you know, I think also Patrick Corbin is in a, a unique situation too at home against the Brewers. So, um, I'm probably going to be under the field with Giolito. And I think I'm just basing this off price 11,000 on DraftKings is, is pretty substantial. And, um, I just don't feel as confident in Giolito as I would probably say a Verlander or Morton or a Corbin. Yeah, I'm I, 600 up to Morton, I, I think, is a, a close enough reach to, to stay away from Giolito. Now, obviously, if you're MMEing and you decide to make the pivot because of ownership, you hope for the upside of six to seven Ks and a seven inning outing from Giolito. That's probably not enough at 11K unless you really nail that other pitcher uh, that he is. Uh, paired up with here on DraftKings. Taking a look at FanDuel, similarly priced. He's at 10-6 over there. Morton is 11-3, so a $700 gap. Syndergaard, 9-8. We'll get to a couple more prices over there on FanDuel momentarily. Uh, you mentioned Corbin. We have Castillo, Syndergaard, Miner. So let's take them sort of as a grouping. Any one of those four stand out the most to you as somebody that you think is in a good spot here? Um, I kind of like Syndergaard. Uh, I, to be honest with you, none of them stand out the most. But, I mean, if we're looking at a, a matchup perspective, I guess I kind of like Corbin or maybe Syndergaard over Castillo. Um, I think Corbin is in a unique spot. Now, when it comes to Milwaukee against left-handed bats, they don't necessarily strike out the most. They're kind of average when it comes to the, to the field. But I do like the lefty-lefty matchup in a lot of situations. And I just – I don't fear that matchup as much. Maybe I would say maybe St. Louis in a hitter's ballpark – in Cincinnati, especially if the weather's just right for the batters. Yeah, the Brewers with a 204 ISO against righties on the year against lefties. I believe it's sub 200, not by much, but uh, it's at 197. So a little bit of a, a tick off of the power against left-handed pitchers. I, I think Syndergaard will be owned here a bit. I think this is a spot where Kansas City gives you uh, some upside, or at least you think, and you see some strikeouts here. But the Royals have had a pretty decent year when it comes to the strikeout percentage against right-handed pitchers. Uh, it's at 20.9%, good for 22nd overall in Major League Baseball. But this could be a very manageable outing for Syndergaard, probably more likely on FanDuel, uh, where you get the quality start. And I think that's a high probability. I'll take a look at some odds momentarily. M minor against Minnesota, I 
I, in Texas, I can't go there. I, I just don't have the, the confidence in Minnesota being subdued in Texas on the offensive side. Any interest in Paddock or, or Dereese, uh here in our 9K range? Paddock is in Philadelphia, which we've seen be a band box before. And Odorizzi is in the same aforementioned Texas Globe Life Stadium. Either of them uh, on your radar at all? Uh, I agree with you with the minor situation. I think there's no chance you pay for that, especially against Minnesota, who have uh, the number four ISO, second Woba, and second WRC plus in the league. So that's a good call there. Um, Paddock is not the same Paddock that we once saw uh, earlier in the year, and he's very inconsistent. And I think going into Philadelphia is probably a scary matchup, considering that there's a lot of power on the Philly side. So I think I'm probably not going to go there um, and pay 9400 for that because at that point, I'm either going to pay up a little bit for Syndergaard or, you know, keep going up or I'm going to, you know, go down and talk probably John Gray, who we'll probably get into here in a minute. But uh, Jake Odorizzi, maybe, but not so much. Um, once again, this is another guy that's been inconsistent. Uh, Odorizzi going into that hitter's ballpark in Texas where the weather's going to be hot, a lot of lefty power in that lineup. And I think that's just a situation I don't want to get into as well. Yep, uh, I'm right there with you. Made mention of the name I was going to go to next. We do have Samarja and Hendricks at 85 and 8200. Samarja in Arizona, I'm not really going to go there. He's had a pretty solid year, honestly. He's, he's come back uh, to not maybe the, the old shark ways, but has been pretty comfortable uh, in that San Francisco rotation. No gigantic blowups like, like we've seen in the past. Hendricks. Not really a strikeout pitcher. And this is a team that he's going up against in Pittsburgh that does not strike out a ton. So you're going to get a couple more walks, less Ks, just does not seem uh, like the upside you need out of an $8,200 pitcher. I know that's cheaper on DraftKings of late, but if you're paying up for one of the top guys, you're going to have to go a little cheaper. Or do we find two guys here in the middle ground for tournament lineups that we're confident have enough upside? You made mention John Gray, yes. Colorado, yes, Coors Field, but the Miami Marlins come to town. Do you pull the trigger here on John Gray at 8K? Uh, 100%. To be honest with you, when uh, projections get updated for the Osmo projections, I, I could see Gray being one of the, if not the highest owned pitcher on DraftKings. I mean, at 8,000 at home uh, facing uh, Marlins team, that's just, there's no power. First off, and secondly, they strike out one of the most in baseball. Uh, this matchup favors him so much, and regardless of where they're playing in cores, it's not one of those teams where you get scared of because there's really not much to offer there on the offensive side. So Gray, a strikeout pitcher, I think that this is in a great matchup. He does pitch fairly well at home at times, so I don't see why you wouldn't want to roster Gray without a doubt. Yep, I'm right there with you. He stood out like a sore thumb when looking through – uh, this slate before we started recording, I will also say uh, that name a lefty on the Marlins who you're afraid of. Uh, there isn't one. Like, and that's the, the, I was say Granderson, and then I'm like, no, not even Granderson. Right. And it's just this is a bad offense. They've been better on striking out as the year's gone on, but this seems like a great spot. I'm intrigued to your point what ownership projection and what the actual ownership is for Gray on DraftKings. The price point works, the matchup works, but will enough people be scared off by Coors Field and its effects to just give us a little bit of an advantage in rostering Gray um, than maybe people staying away from uh, that potential? Now, in the same price range um, is one I love uh, when stuff like this happens. happens. There's uh, P. Sandoval, which first glance I thought somehow or another the Giants were starting Pablo Sandoval at starting pitcher and, and he got el eligibility but no it's in fact Patrick Sandoval uh, who's starting uh, for the Angels uh, he has thrown I think two games for them now in August 95 96 pitches first time out was pretty good second time out not as good but against the Red Sox he does have a matchup here with the Chicago White Sox a team devoid of offensive talent at present they struggle with power they struggle with strikeouts there's enough upside here for the likes of Sandoval and for somebody like Masahiro Tanaka at 7,300. I don't feel as bad as I've felt in other slates about cheaper pitching here, Chris. I think we have some options to play with. Who are some of the names here in the mid-tier that stand out to you? Yeah. Uh, you know, looking at it, I think I do like Vince Velasquez 
at 7,200 uh, at home against the Padres. It's a, it's a huge sh- strikeout upside matchup. Uh, not saying that Velasquez is your high strikeout pitcher, but normally in these situations, when a mediocre pitcher who could get there against a team that does struggle with strikeouts, I, I think that 7,200 could be a nice SB2 option. Um, and then for uh, looking at it too, I do like Kenta Media or Rick Porcello um, in their respective matchups. Uh, Media going against the Braves in Atlanta. He's just really cheap and he does have strikeout upside. So uh, I like to take that in consideration uh, when looking at price point per potential. And then Porcello's at home uh, against Baltimore. A lot of strikeouts in that lineup. Uh, he's been inconsistent, but he has shown over the last few starts that he could get you that 15, 20 point mark. And at 7K, there's nothing wrong there, I don't think. We do. Uh, Velasquez at home, the strikeouts, if that four-seamer is working for Velasquez, if he can get that up in the zone against San Diego, he'll have a big night. Uh, now, obviously, in the band box, it can be, if he's not getting it up, uh, some power. But there is some definite GPP upside for someone like Vince Velasquez at that price point. I will say Tanaka is somebody I, I'm going to probably vacillate a little bit on just because of his last outing. Seems like he's finally figured out that two-seamer slash sinker grip. Had a, a great outing, 14 ground balls, four strikeouts against Toronto, eight innings pitched. Looked like the Tanaka we saw before the elbow issues, uh, before this season rolled around. But it is a Cleveland Indians lineup uh, that does have a ton of power from the left side. They also don't strike out a ton at 19.8%. So more often than not, probably stay away. But he is a name at a cheaper price point that I want to do a little bit more research and see where things fit. And I'll, I'll, I have a tough time with Parcell at large, but the matchup and needing cheaper pitching, I think I can at least consider him a little bit more. And I, I will want to understand exactly what Patrick Sandoval has to offer. I think he's the sort of name that has some upside. Any cheap guys... Uh, you have Sandy Alcantara on the other side of that Colorado game. Mike Leake pitching for Arizona against San Francisco. We know how bad the Giants have been on the year. They don't uh, have any real power, it would seem. Uh, this is a team that strikes out 22.6% of the time, 173 ISO and 92 WRC+. Plus. So they've climbed up a little bit there. Any interest in a guy like Leake in Arizona against San Francisco? Yeah, I think once we get down to that bottom 6,000, 5,000, 4,000 range, I think the only two pitchers you could possibly trust that have somewhat have potential are Musgrove and Leak. And, um, of course, Leak uh, does have the ability to, to get strikeouts. And as we know, San Francisco uh, does struggle uh, against right-hand pitching as they do left-hand pitching. But I think he's, I think he's probably in a better matchup um, as compared to Musgrove. But once again, low price points. These are two pitchers that could go five or six innings, and they have the ability to kind of limit runs and get your three, four, five strikeouts. So when looking at an SP2, I guess you got to factor all those into consideration, and uh, I don't think there's anything wrong there going with them as an SP2. Yeah, I think uh, you have some upside from both of them. San Francisco, clearly a worse offense than the Cubs, but the Cubs do have uh, some strikeouts in them. So that is uh, some potential upside there. Uh, in those matchups. I think that's going to do it for the positive end of the pitching pool. When we talk about offenses, quick first glance here for you, Chris. Uh, what are some of your favorite offenses at, at first glance? We have Colorado, obviously, on the slate. Uh, you do have the Yankees. You have the Reds. You have everybody here. So your favorite offenses uh, could be anywhere. Who are some of the names? Who are some of the offenses that pique your interest most right now? Yeah, I mean, I really do like Minnesota and Texas um, against Minor. Uh, it, they're just too good of an offense. Uh, don't strike out a lot. They like to put the ball in play, and uh, they have power um, up and down the lineup. So uh, I think this is a good matchup. Miner's been struggling as of late, and uh, I think this is a matchup where you have the ballpark in your favor. Um, you also have the weather in your favor. So there's a lot of things going on there that really kind of intrigue me with Minnesota going up against Texas. Uh, another lineup, um, obvi- or excuse me, another team, I think, is obviously the Rockies against Alcantara. Um, you just can't pass this matchup up. Alcantara gives up power, and you also have a matchup where it's in cores. Can't really overlook that. Um, so that's another thing that, uh, or that's another team I'm going to be look at. And then outside of that, um, I think one team that's really sticking out um, that could maybe go under the radar is the Diamondbacks against Samarja. Uh, Smart is a different pitcher on the road and uh, going into Arizona. I think this is a matchup that favors the Diamondbacks. Um, 
I could see them getting around to Smarge and him really kind of giving up a lot of runs. So I, I like that matchup. Yeah, I dig it. I, I like that call, even though I was talking up to Marge a little bit before. I do think uh, you have to consider that he pitches at home at AT and T at oh sorry Oracle Park, whatever it's called this year, um, and uh, has some definite downside when leaving that park. You made mention of Colorado. Agree there to point out. Interestingly, I'm with you on the Twins, and I think this is a potential blow up spot for Minor. Uh, that line as of right now is even and the over under is 10. So both teams with a 4.9 or, or 5.1 implied run total uh, between Odorizzi and Minor. Don't know if that's Vegas giving these two starters more credit for what they've done this year, uh, but it is saying it's supposed to be 100 degrees in Texas. So enjoy that. And I'll point out also the Orioles and Red Sox currently Boston minus 260 on the money line. So you're talking about Porcello has some upside there, definite win equity, or if you're looking over on FanDuel potential for the quality start and the win, what is intriguing to me here is that the over under matches Coors Field. So the over under is 12 for the Red Sox and the Orioles. It is the same over there in Coors Field. I wonder though, if Kyle Freeland was on the mound for Colorado, if we'd see, that line creeping closer to 13. John Gray maybe suppressing a half run or maybe even a run uh, in that spread. Just checking to see if there's anything else of interest here. You know, I, I just I, I just checked something and uh, two things to point out. Uh, one is Alcantara. I guess I would, I must have mistaken him for um, Hernandez, but Alcantara uh, only given up almost almost 1.01 home run per nine and, and really a nine percent home run to fly ball rate. He actually pitched this earlier this year against the Rockies and shut them down completely. So, you know, looking at that, which I didn't know uh, beforehand, in a weird way, um, I think I would actually roster Alcantara as SP2 in a few uh, lineups just because of that potential. All right. I dig that. I dig the uh, also uh, checking some out. You said there were two, were there two things or is that two things on Alcantara? Oh, and then the other one that I, uh, that I really didn't overlook cause I didn't want to just say every team, but I mean, uh, Aaron Brooks, let's just talk about him for a second. He is horrible. So uh, I will be heavy on the Red Sox. He's got a 2.36 home run per nine and a 21% home run to fly ball rate in going in that into Fenway. Um, I think Devers, I think Bogarts, Betts, um, I mean, even Vasquez and, and Travis and below, this is a great matchup for the Red Sox. They're probably going to be the highest on team. Yep. Uh, I agree there just to point out a couple other lines and this is early. So, uh, I don't want to say this is what we'll see as of about 6 PM Eastern time on Friday night, but Tampa Bay minus 300 against Detroit and Daniel Norris with an over under of eight. Wow. So that really is projecting Charlie Morton as uh, the highest uh, favorite and the uh, one with the probably lowest run total against. Got to check where Verlander is on that. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's see. Scrolling, scrolling. Well, let's get Angels. Found this one interesting. Angels and White Sox, eight and a half over under. The Angels are minus 120 in that one. Astros are minus 200 and over under of nine against the A's. So you do have a little bit more uh, from Vegas, at least right now, of Charlie Morton. Uh, as a favorite and a better over under, but you made the point about the Red Sox. It's that's just going to be a, a big spot for them. We'll check out ownership and so much more over at Osmo.com. I made a promise before that I'd give you a little bit more about Yahoo DFS. Uh, we do have information on some of their big tournaments. Week number one, one million dollar guaranteed NFL million dollar baller. Try to say that five times fast, but 100k to first, 50k to second. It's a flat payout structure, no management fee. So they're waiving the management fee, 10 entry max, $25 enter, 25% of the field is paid out, at least double their entry fee. And then you have 100K guaranteed, 20K to first, 10 entry max, $10 enter, 12% management fee. And then you have the NFL Yahoo Cup, and that is free to enter, and it's a 5K weekly prizes, and then $150,000 in total prizes. I've been teasing it all summer long, Chris, that Yahoo would come through with big NFL tournaments, and they're doing just that. So if you're playing the Millie Maker on DraftKings or the Millionaire, whatever it is on FanDuel, you also still have Yahoo, which we sponsor here, and I'll, I'll point out Fantasy Draft. Like, there are so many other places to play as well. If you're planning for week one of the NFL, spread out some of that money, figure out where your best advantage is, look at the different price points across the different sites, and see where you can build your most optimal lineups and make sure uh, you're thinking of it that way. Have you started building any NFL lineups as of yet, or are you still slowly getting into football mode? 
Uh, well, I just did the uh, Osimo Fantasy League draft. So that was like my kickoff to really starting getting ingrained in NFL. But um, I started flirting around just a tiny bit uh, on FanDuel. But I, once again, next week, the end of next week is when I'm going to start really getting into it heavy. There you go. Plenty of projections over at Osmo.com for season long. And of course, we'll have tons and tons of DFS content each and every week. So you want to check that out again. Use the promo code EARLYBIRD. Get yourself 50% off your first month. And then you are part of the team. You get uh, Osmo Plus. That is our premium offering. The Slack chat. You get the projections, ownership projections, and all the articles and so much more. With that said, find Chris on Twitter at Chris Randome. Find me at Dan Strafford. Yes, we are the creative team of Twitter names right there. Uh, but uh, you can also find Osmo at Osmo underscore com and follow Osmo NFL, Osmo and uh, MLB, Osmo Weather, one of the funnier Twitter accounts out there. So you'll want to check that out as well. So with that said, wish you the best of luck on Friday slate. We'll see you Saturday morning, myself and Adam, with the DFS Early Bird presented by Osmo.com.